welcome back to another episode of a very British space program. It's 37 days since Matthew West went into orbit and he's starting to show signs of stress. Um, the UK space program is uh, is going to have to have a make difficult decision. Uh, they may have to see if he can stay up there for a little longer. So um, please join us. So while the Faraday 2 can fly autonomously, um, as pilot Matthew West is expected to ask as, act as a backup for that and um, that onboard system. And currently there is a risk that he may not be able to do that because he's becoming highly stressed. So we're, we're gonna monitor him. Um, it is decided that he should continue on. However, um, it's gonna take 20 days to prepare another Faraday 2 just in case. So it's gonna be a problem. Let's see what happens, I think. However, on the 9th of May 1965, we have the launch of Messenger 11. This is going to Saturn. Um, it's going to spend probably about a week in orbit before departing. Um, this is acting as a backup for our earlier Saturn mission. I think it was uh, Messenger, I can't remember the top of my head, 4, I want to say 4 or 3, uh, which is en route to Saturn at the moment. And this is, again, just going up on a, uh, a Blue Knight rocket. It is again a uh, Hesperus 4B, so it's got that change in uh, in engines. It's got the the smaller, multiple smaller engines, and it's got sort of operated tankage. It's got operated engine power. The RCS has improved. It's more efficient. It's got a better antenna. So it's just going to be just generally, it's more updated. But in reality, it's the same sort of foundation craft as we sent up originally for the mission to Saturn. And this is just going to be the backup. Um, again, it's going to spend about a day in orbit, uh, a week in orbit before it sets off. So once in orbit for about a week, so this is now the 15th of May 1965, it is going to depart for Saturn. Um, if all goes plan, and you can well, you can actually see it long firing its its engines there, and then decoupling, and it's going to use its engines on the actual probe now because we can't just use the uh, intermediate transfer stage for the burn. It does not have enough push, shall we say? We have to use quite a lot of the fuel on board the main craft. We don't leave much behind, and of course, that's one of the things of this Hesperus Four design is the fact that it's designed to give us the ability to go to most of the planetary bodies in different ways. So we use the uh, intermediate transfer stage for the the local system for uh, Venus, not Venus, yeah, Venus, Mars, Mer well, sort of Mercury, but the, the near planets, the inner planets with uh, that. And then we use, uh, we, we need to use more fuel from the actual probe itself for the outer ones. Um, unlike Messenger 5, uh, this is uh, not going to try initially to capture. It's not going to be planned for a direct capture. What we're, we really want is to actually get sort of a little skim into the atmosphere of Saturn. We want to get really, really close to Saturn. So we do a lot of refining and we do a lot of orbital maneuvers uh, as we're departing the, the Earth system. We're actually just trying to come in because we want to just clip into the atmosphere. We want to get a feel for that atmosphere. It's a glass giant and we have yet to actually put anything into a gas giant and see what happens. So what we're gonna try and do is just uh, is just skim in there. And we are aware that we might get a bit overheating and things like that, but if you don't try, you know, you don't you don't know. Um, the big thing for this is because it's a backup, we can change its its uh, its its arrival and things like that on on arriving at the system. So we can actually change this just a little bit and it can actually be a little bit more sort of usable in that regard if we need to but again that depends which of the craft is going to arrive first if it arrives first and I, I, I we need to check its actual arrival time but um if it arrives first um we will probably still carry out this maneuver because the other craft will be on its way already so we'll be able to do that so we do a sort of a general bit of rcs type burn we use some of the uh, the small engines that we have on there so we can actually carry out this burn and it's not a massive well it's not a tiny burn, but it's not a massive burn. It's actually something we can use with onboard fuel. And it should leave us with just about just about enough fuel, hopefully, to, to actually capture. We're not gonna be getting a tight capture. We're probably gonna have quite an elliptical orbit when we do that. But we also need to see what actually going through that atmosphere is gonna do for us. Going through that atmosphere might take some speed off, might actually help us in the capture. So 
back up on the station. It is the 9th of June 1965 and a stress rises and supply start to drop. It's time to bring the crew home. So the crew of F013 are coming home. Their stress levels through the roof in many ways where we're actually concerned about just how stressed they are. And this points out one of the problems with that station, with the uh, the endurance stations. They're a little small, they're a little cramped and, and you do get, you can actually see there, Matthew and, and his partner there, don't look as sane as you might expect of crews returning to earth right now. Um, we, uh, we're gonna have to look at those stations and uh, can, we, can we actually modify them? Can we adapt and what can we do with them? Because if we're gonna want to actually, um, if we're gonna want to actually stay up in space for a long time, we're going to need to actually have uh, the ability for our crew not to go completely insane, would be the thing, or space crazy is probably what the media will call it. Anyway, um, we do have some issues on atmospheric entry. Um, the RCS on, on the autopilot was over firing. We, we just generally, as we come into the atmosphere there, you can see the, the autopilot cannot seem to hold very well the craft we've got a lot of wobble developing and that's primarily due to the uh, the over firing of the rcs there you can see there it's really starting to rotate so what we end up actually doing is matthew has to take over we have to and there you go without rcs it starts to tumble in a really weird way matthew ends up taking over and um we have to sweep over, switch over to him do it luckily he's actually able to he's not gone completely crazy um, but he's able there you can see he's now taken over he's just he's just orientating the craft through through the plasma phase um, all that heating building up there's a ball of plasma underneath the craft there and, and communications non-existent so he's taken over he's bringing it through the atmosphere and um, he's coming in for a landing and this is Matthew's final flight he will be retiring after this mission he's going to go off to to be head of the astronaut training program or head of the astronaut corps he's going to decide who's flying where and doing what but he is not flying anymore i think i think the this trip to the station and the time there is um it's done enough for him he's had he's had 90 days up there that's enough so the day later on the 10th of june 1965 it is well it's going to be what's probably known as Ceres month um, we are launching quite a lot of craft up to Ceres and the first of those is is an old faithful actually this is a Blue Knight 2 rocket with a Hesperus 4B orbiter um, and this is Messenger 12 uh, and it's launching from our uh, launch complex 4 which is our standard uh, Blue Knight 2 launch facility down in Australia um, it's going to do its usual Hesperus thing of sitting in orbit for um, in this case about three or four days before it actually goes anywhere. However, this is series month, so we're not gonna send just one mission, we're sending three. But we're not sending, we're not sending Hesperus craft, we're not just sending Hesperus craft, no, no, no. This is the only Hesperus craft that's gonna go on this mission. We have something a little, well, it, it's newer, and it's, um, it's bigger, and it requires that we fly it a little bit differently, but uh, let's get to that, shall we? So, the, uh, the, the Hesperus is in orbit, so, Next up we have, oh, this is a big one. This is the 11th of June, 1965, and this is Sparrowhawk 1 on a Blue Knight 2B booster, nicknamed the Heavy, which you will see why in a moment. It has a vast number of engines on the bottom there. The first stage, well, the first two stages technically, are 27 engines, 27 of our Tau 2 engines pushing it up. And this is by far the most powerful rocket that we have built today i will let you into a secret there is something bigger coming and it's actually going to break our naming convention so there we go the side boosters have gone we've got a little tiny burn left on that middle core um, and then we have our standard upper stage but we've stretched it it's now got a bit more push so it's now been put a bit over but now you will notice we are not burning if i if we if the camera pans around in a second it will do anyway uh, we're not burning all of our uh, our spectre engines on this stage we're actually holding some of them back because this stage is gonna do part of the uh, the burn out as well. So it's actually gonna use some of this, this stage is actually gonna be basically reused. And there we go, you can see we're actually just firing just the four middle engines to start the exit burn. This craft is not gonna hang around in orbit. It basically completed about half an orbit, an orbit, and then we're sending it off to series. Um, it's gonna use the upper stage to boost it in that orbit. And then the uh, intermediate transfer stage will step in 
and take over. And of course, this intermediate transfer stage is a little bit different to the others. It's again been stretched a little bit. It's been enlarged a little bit just to give it a bit more power because we've got a very heavy craft on the top there that you're going to see. We have the sparrow hawk. The sparrow hawk is two parts, the sparrow and the hawk. The sparrow is a tiny little landing craft that we're hoping to be able to deploy. And the hawk is, well, it's an orbiter. It's our orbiter that's going to act as its little communications uh, partner that's going to be in orbit, flying around, hopefully relaying signal back to, uh, back to Earth, back to us, so that we can actually, you know, get some pictures get some samples done, you know. This will not be returning to Earth, but we can do some samples on the ground. We can have a look at it. And you can see there we're burning the ITS now, and it is, is a slightly stretched ITS, not massively, but it is a little bit bigger. And you can have a good look there at the little tiny lander on the top there. It's very small, and it's the orbital craft. The orbiter there has enough uh, fuel, we hope, to do any man maneuvers required, and then to, uh, to bring to bring it into orbit as needed around Ceres. And we're hoping that there's enough there. So we're hoping that's gonna be okay. You can see there a good view of the craft, a little tiny lander, and we're actually using tiny, tiny engines on that. We're actually using RCS engines to do the landing. And it's got tiny, tiny legs that we've actually had to manufacture their fixed legs. So also on the 11th of June, we actually have the launch of Sparrowhawk Two. So we're not sending just one, we're sending two. And this again is on another Blue Knight 2B Heavy. Um, and this is, like the previous one, going to be launched from one of our two launch pads. So the previous the previous launch was from Launch Complex 10, which is brand new, it's just come online. And this is from Launch Complex 5. And both of these are pretty much the largest we can build. We have the ability now to launch craft of pretty much any size we want and we're hoping that actually we can take full advantage of that you can see there the side boosters go off first and then we have a very short period where we've just got the center core and then that ends um the center core doesn't burn for any longer than it does on a on a a blue a blue knight 2a um, the side boosters give it that push at the start but do not burn as long as the main core even though they use the same number of engines and then we have Again, our uh, our second stage just pushing us up into into orbit there. Now this time we have made a slight change. We want to get a bit of more push at the uh, at the the second stage, the relight of the second stage. Is it a relight if we're not using the same engines? Anyway, um, so we've actually we've held back a few more engines there um, uh, as we do. So so that's going to be doing that, and it's going to be pushing itself out there on its mission. And uh, there we go, it's firing off. We actually cut out that bit because the uh, the, oh, the upper stage doing this. So we're just gonna fire the intermediate transfer stage. And this one basically heads off at the same time as well. It's, it's as soon as it gets to orbit, it is gonna fly off there and it's gonna use that intermediate transfer stage to do this. Now, one of the problems we did notice with this was that, um, well, uh, the, the being a new craft, uh, we didn't get our launches perfect, shall we say, and we definitely didn't get our departures perfect. And one of the problems with the interplanetary transfers is if you get your departure slightly wrong, it can add a lot into what you're actually doing. So the, the Sparrowhawk 1, uh, sorry, for Sparrowhawk 2 there, we'd actually learned a lot from when we launched it. That's part of the reason why we changed how many of its engines on that upper stage you actually relight. Uh, or, or lit because we wanted to actually give it a bigger quicker push so it could be more accurate in where we're going to um, and you can see here it's actually you know it is quite difficult to get an intercept with the series particularly something of this size and this launch characteristic because we have a lot of slow burning engines and we're, we're just trying to bring the craft together and you can see they're moving out the ITS is going to take it out there what will actually happen with Sparrowhawk 2 is it's going to do um, some maneuvers slightly later on once this burn is completed when we're in a position where we can actually refine that interaction and, and that, that refining that interaction you can see there we're heading out and we're just going to kill it there now we're not actually getting an interaction right now the, the, the patch conics is not showing it we will be able to in the future though we're going to be able to refine that uh, a little bit um, and so that will actually that will head out there and and do that in in probably the next episode you'll see that because we don't have much time left in this episode so there you go the Sparrowhawk 2 just out there doing its thing, doing its stuff. It's got a lot of fuel left. Now, 
Then we come on back to Sparrowhawk 1. Because of the delay that the Sparrowhawk 1 had, um, yeah, it, it had to do some burning of its own with its RCS on its uh, on its Hawk section. Because we don't want to light those engines, they're one-use engines, they're designed to pull it into orbit of Ciri. Um, so we have to use its, its RCS, which is fine because the RCS has been uprated a little bit. It's a little bit more efficient. It's not perfect, but it's a little bit more efficient. Um, however, this did mean we, because we have very small RCS on the Hawk craft and it's carrying a bit of extra mass, um, Sparrowhawk 1 had to do a 15 minute RCS burn. Um, I can tell you now, this was tedious. This was beyond tedious and I've actually cut this out. This is the end of it. This is the very end of it, in fact. So, as we finish that burn and we're getting into a nice path towards series, next episode we're going to see what else is happening. Um, but from me, until next time, have a great one.